Today we are in Revelation chapter 17. You can flip open your Bibles to there. By now it should become should have become clear that Revelation is a book that's concerned with covenantal and religious themes. It is not a political book, though there are political ramifications and consequences. When we think about kingdoms, like the kingdom of God, we tend to think politically in terms of politics. And I think in large part that's because of our society, a society in where, where identity and politics are almost inseparable. But we can't get trapped in that snare. In reading Revelation, we must be able to to separate its primary meaning from the political side of things. This is a book about covenants. Today's passage in Revelation 17, it's going to use this symbolism of a harlot that has violated her covenant of marriage. As we look at this, I want to throw a disclaimer out there. Today is a PG uh, rating. Maybe on the upper end of PG. So if you have young kids, you don't want to hear some things about harlotry. Uh, There are places for them to go. The final bowl of the wrath of God has been poured out upon Jerusalem. God was destroying apostate Israel and the covenant that they had abominated All his divine anger being poured out upon them, and we see its physical fulfillments in the siege upon Jerusalem in 70 AD, a siege that ended when Rome burned that city and destroyed the temple, tearing every stone down, not leaving one on top of another. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD with the spending of God's wrath towards that city, it was the pouring out of the seventh bowl of wrath that we looked at in Revelation 16, today in chapter 17, it's as if one of the angels of the seven bowls of wrath takes us inside that seventh bowl of wrath to show us what was going on with that seventh bowl. So this is like a zoomed in view now of the seventh bowl. And as we look at chapter 17, I want to open the symbolism to you. I want to show you what's going on there. And I hope that it is an encouragement and a warning to each one of us. So let's read Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and, sat and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on the many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of the earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations and the impurities for her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon, the great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, It is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour 
together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out this purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Father, these are some challenging words, but they are your words. We need your words for our life. We do not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth, these words. So, Father, I pray that as we read them, feast on them, it would indeed produce life in our souls, life that springs into eternity. Help us to see, help us to hear, Father. Help me to speak. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, right off the bat, I want to identify the two main figures of Revelation 17. We have a beast and we have a prostitute. The prostitute is Jerusalem. The beast is Rome. Revelation is a book of patterns and symbols, and it repeatedly wraps its significant figures in different symbols. So think of Jesus. He's been symbolized or, or wrapped in symbolism of an angel, of a lion, of a lamb, of a white rider, of this son of man, all of that about Jesus. Jerusalem, it happens to Jerusalem as well. It's wrapped in the symbolic names of Sodom and Egypt. We saw it wrapped in the symbolism of a, a beast that rises out of the land. And here we are seeing it wrapped in the symbolism of a prostitute. And this prostitute is what first comes into view in Revelation 17. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. So we're going to spend some time, a significant amount of time, unpacking these two verses right here. The angel tells John that he will see the great prostitute, and she is seated on many waters. It's all very very symbolic, deeply symbolic, as the whole chapter is symbolic, as the whole book is deeply symbolic. The symbols of verse 1 are so powerful, and I think that as we move through it, it's going to become abundantly clear what it is they mean. So the first symbol, the great prostitute. To understand this, we need to think of this covenant, covenantally, we're going to think of it covenantally like a marriage. So we're going to trace a thread through Scripture, it begins all the way back in Exodus, where God loved Israel. And in Israel's youth, she loved him too, because God had rescued her, had broken her bonds, he had washed her, he took her into the wilderness, and there, there God married Israel, the foot of Sinai. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, we read, God saying, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. Yet despite such beautiful and hopeful beginnings, again and again and again, Israel wanders off into unfaithfulness. The scripture very viscerally begins to symbolize this unfaithfulness as adultery, as a prostitution. In fact, the entire book of Hosea is about that symbolic image. All over the Old Testament, 
You see God calling unfaithful Israel a whore. Among many other places, the imagery of a harlot bride kicks off the two largest prophetic books. Isaiah Isaiah says, How the faithful city has become a whore. She who who was full of of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. The book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. For long ago, I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree, you bowed down like a whore. There's another prophetic book that takes this symbolic language to a whole new level, Ezekiel. Dare I say that the most sexually explicit And crude chapters in the entire Bible are Ezekiel 16 and 23. They are so explicit, so graphic, that your English translation masks what the Hebrew is really saying. I'm not going to tell you because I promise you it would absolutely make you squirm in your seat. And I'm sure that the, the Hebrews who first heard it were offended entirely by its message. But Ezekiel 16, especially, is going to be important for our understanding of Revelation 17. So I'm going to read for you a little bit of Ezekiel 16 while leaving out some of its more explicit elements. There we read, How sick is your heart, declares the Lord God, because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute. Yet you were not like a prostitute, because you scorned payment adulterous wife who receives strangers instead of her husband. Men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you gave your gifts to all your lovers, bribing them to come after you from every side with your whorings. No one solicited you to play the whore, and you gave payment, while no payment was given to you. That is some twisted imagery. Israel was unlike all other prostitutes, this bride of God, she was paying strangers for their passion. It's disturbing and it's heartbreaking. God's beloved wife cannot give herself away fast enough to as many lovers as she can find. And so from Sinai to Armageddon, I want to summarize this thread for you. God rescues Israel in her youth, this young and beautiful woman, and she was faithful to him, and God gives her a home in the promised land, but while she is there, dwelling in abundance, she becomes restless. She begins to, t- begins to take other lovers, and this gut-wrenching pattern emerges of wandering and return, of wandering and return. And centuries later, As the armies of Babylon collect around Jerusalem, it's as if this harlot bride has been lost to her depravity, and she is desperate, and she is delusional. So picture this woman now in her her 20s, and a complete train wreck. And in Revelation, things have dramatically progressed. The harlot, she has long been away from her husband, She's established now. She's become very successful in her craft. And though it appears that she has entirely embraced the darkness of her trade, she hasn't lost a bit. Ooh. She hasn't lost a bit of her stunning beauty. So now imagine her in her mid-30s. Hey, why don't you just unplug that? All right, thanks. So now imagine this harlot in her, her mid-30s. The picture in Revelation is God's harlot bride, happy to prostitute herself to kings. As verse 2 says, she has become this glorified leech. And not only is Jerusalem unwilling to come home to return to her first love, she has killed God's messengers and she has killed his one and only son. So God's patience has ended. This is the symbolic picture of God's divorce of this harlot bride. 
How fitting then that at the end of Revelation, there is a new marriage and a new bride. In verse 2, we learn that Jerusalem is guilty of two separate but related evils. One, she has committed sexual immorality with the kings of the earth. Two, she has made the inhabitants of the land drunk with her sexual immorality. So we're going to unpack these one at a time to help understand the rest of the chapter. She has committed sexual immorality with the kings of the earth. So the kings of the earth, they'll be described later on in the chapter. But understand this from the Mosaic law. Submitting to the laws and the customs of of pagan kingdoms or societies for commercial or political gain, that was abominable for Israel. She was not to do that. In Leviticus 18, we read, You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. Listen to this. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules, keep my commandments, and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. The highly explicit language of Ezekiel 16 and 23 is used to symbolize Jerusalem doing this very thing. Where they are, instead of being faithful to God and obeying God's laws, they are now choosing expediency, political expediency, and doing what the surrounding nations want them to do for their own prospering. And so it uses the most potent, explicit language in the Bible to symbolize how disgusting that is to God. Now when we come to the first century, the Jewish religious establishment was in bed with their Roman overlords, their political overlords. They had happily accepted a a massive temple renovation from wicked Herod, who killed the children of Bethlehem. They received temple donations from Rome. They even chose Caesar to be their king. This guy who called himself the son of God. Pilate said to the Jews, Behold, your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. The chief priests of the temple wanted Caesar for their king. As Jerusalem's husband stood before them, ready to die for her, she chooses this foreign lover. Indeed, Jerusalem was committing sexual immorality with the kings of the earth. The Greek word gi is employed twice in verse 2. I've been corrected on this word. Gi is pronounced gay. So get used to that. As you know, it can be, this word gay can be translated either as earth or as land. And the way that we translate that, either in earth or land, is based on the context. So verse 2 should read, the kings of the earth, earth, the first time. And then the second time, it should be translated, those who dwell on the land. And we know that because of its context. The kings came from abroad, like from Rome. But those who fell under the sway of the prostitute, most profoundly were those who lived in the land. They lived under the Jewish religious establishment. They were drunk on her sexual immorality. And we see an example of that at Christ's crucifixion. It was the religious leaders that stirred the Jews against Jesus. They wanted the people intoxicated on rituals and laws and traditions and whatever it was that they said rather than to worship the true and living God who became flesh and was in their midst. And Jesus levied this against them. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. 
For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across sea and land to make a single convert, and when he does become a convert, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. So not only had Jerusalem committed sexual immorality with the kings of the earth, but she also made her inhabitants drunk with that same sexual immorality. Now look at verse 3. And he, the angel, carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. One of the seven angels who held the seven bowls tells John he wants to show him something. And then he takes John in the spirit to a place where he can see. That exact same sequence of events is going to happen again in Revelation. When John, in chapter 21, when John is going to see a new bride and a new Jerusalem, there's a paralleling happening, a contrasting happening. But this time, in seven, chapter 17, John is taken into the wilderness. Throughout Scripture, the wilderness is the haunt of demons of the condemned, of Beelzebub. That's where Satan tempted Jesus, in the wilderness. When Israel failed to trust in God, she was condemned to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and here she is again in the wilderness with the demons. In verse 1, the harlot was seated on many waters, but now in verse 3, she sits upon the beast, paralleling. Remember that beast from chapter 13? The beast is described in virtually the exact same way. And if you want a deeper understanding of that description, then go listen to the sermon from Revelation 13. But this time, the beast is given a color, scarlet. The beast is beginning to look more like the great red dragon, who is Satan. In chapter 13, we saw the beast rising out of the sea. So you saw that parallel. The woman was seated on many waters, and then she's seated on the beast. In chapter 13, the beast rose out of the sea. Look at verse 15 now in chapter 17. The angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. We've seen it. How many times now in Revelation, the sea is a symbol for the Gentile world. Rome controlled the Gentile world as far as they understood the world. The more control, the more power that Rome gained over the world, the more that it merged with the practices and purposes of Satan himself. So that truly you could say, Satan was Caesar, Nero his puppet. Satan and Caesar and Rome, they were all engaged in this dangerous mind meld, and Revelation is depicting it as nearly inseparable, indistinguishable at this point. As Jerusalem prospered, because of her relationship to Rome, it was as if she was riding upon the back of this beast, the beast that rose from the many waters. Verse 4 it says, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations and, pu- and impurities of her sexual immorality. The harlot's dressed like a queen here. But this is not meant to symbolize her decadence or her extravagance. In fact, the clothes that she's wearing and all that jewelry... It was all given to her by her husband. Ezekiel chapter 16 again. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver 
You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. Your beauty was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. So you can see in Revelation 17's imagery that this harlot bride, Jerusalem, she is twisted. She is demented. Because in a way, she's boasting about her marriage to God. She's adorned in all the clothing and the crown that was given to her by God. And yet there is no shame in seducing other lovers. She has turned her relationship with God into her own vanity. So do any of us. When we use our relationship with God to boost our reputation, to make us seem pious or religious or together, we become self-righteous hypocrites and we need to return to our first love, which was Christ's rebuke of the Ephesian church in chapter 2. Return to your first love. Notice in verse 4 how the harlot drinks from a golden cup filled with her sexual immorality. This too should remind you of Christ's words from Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Verse 5, and on her forehead was written the name of mystery. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. Jerusalem the harlot, given the name Babylon. As we've seen in chapters earlier, as I've mentioned already, Jerusalem has been given other symbolic names before, Egypt and Sodom, because she is cursed. Babylon is similar, but Babylon is so much more, this name. God once cleansed the earth with a flood. And after that flood, this cancer still came bursting out of the hearts of men. Sin. And so, for the first time in human history after that flood, humanity began to organize itself against God. As people migrated from the east, they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we disperse over the face of the whole earth. And so they built the tower, and it enraged God because it was in direct rebellion against him. The name of that tower was Babel. The name of that city was Babylon. Was Babel. Babylon was built upon Babel. So unlike any other city in Scripture, Babylon is a symbol of man's rebellion against God, man's organized rebellion against God. Jeremiah 50 Repay Babylon according to her deeds. Do to her according to all that she has done, for she has proudly defied the Lord, O Holy One of Israel. Behold, I am against you, O proud one, declares the Lord God of hosts, for your day has come, the time when I, puni- when I will punish you. Babylon, the symbol of man's rebellion against God this name being given to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem has become drunk on the blood of the martyrs. But before Christian martyrs, Babylon, Jerusalem, she was drunk long ago. Just when she was about to take that first sip of Christian blood, Stephen, the first martyr, cries out, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you now have betrayed and murdered, you who received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. 
Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. Hear that rebellion? Jerusalem was Babylon, openly defiant against God, drunk on the blood of the saints. And according to Mosaic law, the epitome of unclean foods or drinks was blood. And amazingly, verse 6 ends with John marveling at the harlot. It's hard to really see what's going on there in the English, but it could be accurately translated when, John speaking, when I saw her, I was amazed at how attractive she was. It's as if for a moment, John is, is getting pulled into her beauty, despite all of the danger. He quickly understands the reason why she has so many lovers. And then it takes this angel to wake him up, to snap him out of it. Verse 7. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. So John sees her seductions and momentarily pulls him in. You know, whenever we look with the eyes of the flesh, we can fall under that same type of deception. Something that looks so good. And if we are not alert, we would join ourselves with demons. Yes, I'm speaking of lust, and yes, I'm speaking of so many other things that our eyes want. Superficial things, temporary things. And when we go there, we join ourselves with demons. But the angel is there to remind John and to remind us of the terrible spiritual ugliness that devours men and women. He will show John what it all means. Verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. So the angel here is further depicting the beast having merged with the dragon. For the beast has become a mockery of God. The beast has become something like an anti-God. Remember in Revelation how God was categorized, what God said of him, or what John said of God? Revelation 1, 4, grace to you and peace from him who, was, who is and who was and who is to come. Twice in verse 8, we see that same sort of phrasing employed. The primary reason for this phrasing, who is, who was, who is, who is to come, The primary reason for that phrasing is to show us that this beast is a mockery of God, trying to set himself up in the place of God, in the temple of God. It was and was to come or goes to destruction. Verse 11, we're going to see another layer of that phrasing and what it means. But we see here in in verse 8, that everyone not found in the book of life from before the foundation of the world will marvel at the beast, will be in awe of the beast. These people are in the exact same category as the Jews that have taken the mark of the beast, who have given their hearts to the beast. They will look in the face of Jesus Christ and call Caesar their king. They marvel at the beast and not their Christ. Only the elect are truly able to recognize who is king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He is seen in the face of Jesus Christ who is the exact imprint of the nature of God. There is nowhere else that we can go and the elect know this like we know that we breathe, we want him more than we want our own lives. He is our king. And if you know that, if you believe that, 
Then you, like these, have had your name written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world was laid. It is secure. No one will remove your name from that book to the everlasting glory of our Father. Verses 9 and 10. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. So we've looked at these two verses now a number of times during the sermon series. The seven mountains were the seven hills of Rome, which the city was built upon. So we call New York City the Big Apple, and we call New Orleans, Orleans the Big Easy, and Vegas is Sin City, and Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. And in the ancient world, Rome was the city of seven hills, or the city of seven mountains. So this was like a code name for Rome. The seven kings are Roman Caesars. Five of whom have fallen. One is. One is come, and when he comes, he will only remain for a short while. The five that have fallen, Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Tiberius Caligula, Caligula, and Claudius. The one that is, when John writes, is Nero. And the one that is to come is Galba. And he will remain only for seven months and seven days. A little while. So not only does this show us that John writes Revelation during Nero's reign, but it makes it clear, crystal clear, that Rome is the beast. Verse 11. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. Back in chapter 13, we read that the beast would receive a mortal wound and then be healed. And I said that this was fulfilled when the Julio-Claudian dynasty failed. And a new dynasty in Rome was established, the Flavian dynasty. So the Julio-Claudian dynasty, which started with Julius Caesar and it ended with Nero when he committed suicide in 68 AD, halfway through this tribulation that came upon Jerusalem. And a civil war followed. Rome was thrown into chaos It was the year of the four Caesars, and these men who were trying to rise to the throne of Caesar and establish peace, Galba being the first, they quickly rose and they were quickly killed and murdered until Vespasian came. Vespasian, who was leading the siege against Jerusalem, or the war against Jerusalem, went to Rome and he became emperor. He brought peace, he ended the civil war, and he established a new dynasty, the Flavian dynasty. The mortal wound that Rome had received, was healed. We're adding another layer to verse 8. The beast was, and then it was not, and then it was to come in the Flavian dynasty. Vespasian being this eighth king that we read about here in uh, 17 verse 11. Vespasian was separate because he did not belong to the Julio-Claudian dynasty, the only dynasty that Rome could conceive of. He didn't belong to that, but he belongs to, to them in a way because he is still a Roman Caesar and he governed Rome just like a Roman Caesar. And he goes to destruction, it says. Now here I think there are probably layers of fulfillment. Vespasian himself wanted nothing to do with Christ. Himself, he, he himself went to destruction, was condemned. The Flavian dynasty, which he established, was killed or ended when his second son, Domitian, was killed. And then, of course, Rome went to destruction. Because here we are, some 1,500 years after Rome, and it's been collecting dust all this time. Rome is no more, in large part, because of its Christianization. Now, just to throw a note here, I flew through all that stuff. I flew through it. If you want more explanation or depth, this Wednesday night is the last Bible study where I'm going to be talking about this thing. So come 
and ask your questions. There's so much more than what I'm just glossing over right now. Look at verse 12. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So interestingly, when John writes Revelation, there are ten Roman senatorial provinces. You can see them on this map behind me. The provinces are the core of the empire. In fact, they they are so core that the Roman Senate and Caesar found no reason to station any legions there. The legions were stationed in the imperial provinces, the ones in green, because they needed a heavier hand of governance. But the senatorial provinces, the core of Rome, that's where Roman life was most powerful. Each one of these senatorial provinces were all governed by proconsuls, something like an appointed king, higher than a governor. Even still, it is not necessary for these ten proconsuls to be the ten kings of Revelation. Because that would be for us to take it literally, and when we see numbers in Revelation, every time, they are symbolic numbers. Ten symbolizes many, just as a thousand symbolizes a very great many. An enormous quantity. Ten kings are a symbol for all the vassal kings of the Roman Empire who came against Jerusalem, and there were many. All of them were subject to Caesar. Such is the meaning of verse 13. They handed over their authority to the beast that is Rome. They were client kings in vassal states subject to Caesar. And yet these kings do have a power. We read that. They do have a power, and it's a power that comes from the beast. Now here it's critical again to remember, we're not talking politically. The power that they have is not, what's important is not their political power. What's important is their power as it interacts with the covenants. Because the whole book of Revelation is concerned with covenants rather than politics. The kings will be given power to persecute the church, the keepers of the new covenant. They will be given power to destroy apostate Israel, those who insist on keeping the old covenant. This power will be elaborated upon in the following verses, but the power is just for an hour. It's only for a short time. It's brief, which is indeed what we see in history. Verse 14, they will make war on the Lamb, And the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. So there you can clearly see it. Their power is not a political power. It's it's a covenantal relationship. They make war against the Lamb. The kings will be given power to persecute the church, but they will not be victorious. They will go on persecuting the church even after 70 AD. Domitian, who I mentioned before, will be one of the worst persecutors of the church. But the Christians that they kill, they can't kill. They live forever, standing with Christ on Mount Zion. We saw that picture beautifully early in Revelation. They war against Jesus But they stand no chance. The Lamb stands victorious. How true is that? Rome is gone. These kings are gone. Yet Christ stands today as king, as our king. Rome never reached this far on the planet, but here is the kingdom of God. And so today, the ruins of these two cities, of Jerusalem and Rome, they stand as enduring monuments to us, that the word of God endures forever. The rebellions of man fail. Psalm 2, which we have seen many times in Revelation. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. 
Verse 16. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute, and they will make, desolate, make her desolate and naked, and devour her flesh, and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being one of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. In 70 AD, the beast and its ten kings turn against the harlot and they make her an absolute desolation, like Jesus said would happen. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem's former lovers have surrounded her now, and they burn her to the ground. The comment about devouring her flesh is yet again another layer, a reference to Jezebel, Jezebel being one of the most wicked figures in the Old Testament. She gloried in idolatry and sexual immorality, often referred to as a prostitute queen. But when Jezebel came to an end, when she was killed, she had her flesh devoured by dogs. In somewhat racist terms, the Jews often referred to the Gentiles as dogs. And now the Gentiles have come to devour the flesh of Jerusalem. And you see the symbolic layering of Jerusalem not only being equated with Babylon, with Sodom, with Egypt, but now with Jezebel. For they are united in their sexual immorality, in their idolatry, and in their demise. All of this was according to the purposes of God. Rome and its allies, they may have thought that they were acting on their own, and Satan may have thought that it was he who brought the armies to Jerusalem. But the greatest regality, the most fundamental truth, is that it was God who drove all of them to the great city. He declared it, and it would be so. Jerusalem, the abominable prostitute, would be divorced. Hers now was the covenant curse, which we read about in the list of covenant curses in Deuteronomy 28. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. They shall besiege you in all of your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout the land which the Lord God has given you. And that is precisely what happened when God gave to Jerusalem its covenant curses in the Jewish wars. Rome was the hammer in the divine hand, and with it he crushed Jerusalem. Now from this vantage point, brothers and sisters, we gaze into such a deep mystery. And it's one that we cannot plumb the depths of. That God uses the evil of men, even plans the evil of men, to accomplish his good purposes, and he does it without sinning. Joseph famously said, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring, about, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The first century church, the first church, had a deep understanding of this when they prayed in Acts 4, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it, truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. 
The crucifixion was the greatest evil that humanity has ever perpetrated. And God planned it. In fact, in Isaiah 53, we read that it was the will of God to crush Christ. Here is a depth. Here is a depth that we cannot find the bottom of. And honestly, God does not invite us to find the bottom of it. He just says, trust me. Trust me. For even when night falls... It is not outside of his control. When tribulation comes, it's not an accident. It hasn't escaped him. He has still planned it. And through his plans, his will will be accomplished. And that, brothers and sisters, is an unfathomable good for us who love him. He pro- his promises will never fail us. If his word endures, then so will his promises towards us, and we can trust that he is working all things together for our good who love him. Oh, the depths and the riches and the mystery of God. Who has been his counselor and who who can know his mind? We worship him and we trust him. And this chapter ends with verse 18. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. (laughs) So misunderstood. Throughout Revelation, John uses the phrase the great city exclusively to talk about Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the great city here in verse 18, is the great prostitute. Her dominion over the kings of the earth is not a political dominion. It's covenantal. It's religious. In fact, this dominion was given to her as her greatest wedding gift. Exodus 19. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel was to lead the nations to God, a nation of priests. That was her global dominion. But she had taken this gift and she fashioned it into an idol. And in the most explicit terms, Ezekiel 16 describes what she does with such an idol. She had turned her gift into an abomination and now she leads the world in blaspheming God. Paul wrote, You Jews, you say that you must not commit adultery. Do you not commit adultery? You abhor idols. Do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Revelation is God's certificate of divorce. He hates divorce. He hates divorce. Yet he is finished with this harlot bride and her abominations. Not only does she refuse to return to him, but she has killed his servants and she has killed his one and only son. The kingdom of God will never be possessed by geopolitical Israel. Instead, they were given a bowl of wrath to drink. Revelation will end with the cup of a better covenant, with a wedding and a new bride, and a covenant being passed to a new people, a people of faith, a people who, through Christ, love God with all heart, mind, soul, and strength. Peter wrote about this too. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
So may we, brothers and sisters, be tremendously encouraged by that great reality that endures forever, as does the Word of God. And may we see in this chapter a great warning, as the Ephesian church was meant to see, and return to our first love if we have wandered. If we have wandered, repent. Return to your first love. There will only be emptiness found apart from Christ. Forsake those lovers and return. Father, help us all to be faithful to you. How our hearts are prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. But help us, God, to come back. Come back to you who is our first love, who even while we were still sinners, you died for us, demonstrating the greatest love that the universe has ever seen. Help these stony hearts. Crack them open that they might flow with rivers of living water. Thank you for your word, Father, and that it stands, and we, therefore, can stand on it as our enduring rock. We praise you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our King, our Savior, and the bride of this beautiful church, or the, <laughs> the husband of this beautiful church.